As one of the most original Monster Hunter families, the Temneserans are a small family of giant spider-like animals. There's Nursilla, the Shadow Spider, a keen predator known for its use of webs and wearing the skin of its prey. Then there's Rachna Kadaki, the larger and more powerful of the two, known as the Empress Spider. She carries her young, the Rachnoid, with her as she wanders over great distances. They're unique in many ways, with their prey capture, weaponry, and reproduction. So how do these big bugs fare in the land of the Wyverns? To start with Nursilla, perhaps the most two obvious starting points are both the wearing of the skin of her prey species and the toxic spikes formed along her back. What's the how and why of these bizarre attributes? To start with Nursilla's habit of going Buffalo Bill on her prey, this is a behaviour seen in some insects, and is known as corpse camouflage. It's perhaps most prevalent in juvenile assassin bugs, who stick the drained exoskeletons of ant prey on their bodies after feeding. The why of it all is explained as this helps the assassin bugs themselves avoid predation. Both geckos and jumping spiders, the latter of which are their most common predators, avoid or ignore assassin bugs with corpse camouflage but attack those without it. It's suggested it may be because they don't recognise camouflaged individuals as prey, or in the case of jumping spiders especially, it's because they're hesitant to attack ants due to their group defence. It could be a similar situation in Nursilla, that this is to help repel predators. A possible caveat to this is that unlike assassin bugs, Nursilla with her camouflage doesn't look all that different to how she does without it especially compared to the bugs. But camouflage can work in multiple ways. Evidence suggests Nursilla itself has a pretty serious predator or predators, that it has so many defensive features compared to the much larger Rachnakadaki. There's nothing in the lore telling us what it is, and nothing conspecific with Nursilla really seems to stand out as a candidate. But it could be whatever it is tracks her by smell, and the corpse camouflage masks her own scent with that of her prey instead. Alternatively, it may be that humans just can't see the appropriate warnings. Humans still have relatively poor vision in the grand scheme of things, comparatively lacking in our ability to pick up on various wavelengths of light. Much like drab birds that can actually dazzle those with the right eyes, the hides of the species Nursilla selects may well have hidden colours that warn of the toxicity to potential predators, ones with superior vision to ours. After all, Nursilla does select for animals themselves that have very notable anti-predator mechanisms that would make preying on them quite a hassle. But what about Nursilla's own set of toxins? As well as their bite that seems to tranquilise prey, Narcilla secrete toxins that seem to congeal and form stalactites on their back, presumably as Narcilla rest hanging upside down in caves or other concealed areas. From the variable toxins that can be produced coinciding with venomous prey, it does seem Narcilla sequesters these from her food rather than directly producing them herself. These are known as sequestered defensive compounds, and Nursilla does seem to tick the boxes suggested for sequestration, in that she consumes toxic prey and has relatively passive modes of defence. It may also be that Nursilla specifically selects for such prey for her defences as well. Some animals like snakes seem to actively search for poisonous toads when gravid. Not only does this make them toxic, but it carries over to their unborn offspring too. So Nursilla may not just select its prey species at random, it may specifically choose species that will allow it to bolster its own defensive capabilities. With this toxin sequestering, it's worth wondering if shrouded Nursilla is even a true subspecies, when this may well just be caused by a change in diet resulting in different effects. Whether or not it is an actual subspecies or really more of a variant, if that, I also believe Shrouded Nursilla may be one of the subspecies where the type species and game is actually the aberration rather than the norm. Despite her webs, with her giant mouth parts known as scizhorns that seem to be adapted to snatch prey from below, Nursilla seems morphologically more in line with ant lions than spiders, or at least ant lion larvae. 
How did they wind up in more messic environments like the primal forest and sunken hollow then? Well, maybe the behavioural plasticity of antlion larva comes into play here. Antlions aren't just living landmines. They actually modify their behaviour based on cues from their environment. They'll ignore prey that is too small to be profitable, letting it wander on by to conserve their own energy for larger prey that will be worth the effort of capture. They can also recognise the patterns of thieves or threats approaching and take appropriate action to protect themselves and their food. Some species of antlion also don't always dig burrows. They can choose to ambush prey at the surface as well depending on their energetic status. On top of this, some antlion show behavioural asymmetry, and ones that do also show greater capacity for learning. Nursilla that showed similar traits and were more adaptable individuals may well be behaviourally plastic enough to live in entirely new environments. As, after all, Nursilla don't seem that dependent on their burrows and on ambush as antlions themselves. But if Nursilla started in the desert, then how did they get to these new locations? And maybe the old Ice Age theory could be a part of this. Despite typically being associated with Africa, due to their name and being part of the Small Five, a quintet of animals meant to try and showcase smaller animals on safari, antlions have a large geographic range. Much research has been done on specimens from the Bwedov Desert in Poland, which gets to below freezing in winter. We see some environments like the primal forest are flanked by what seem to be open meadows, and ice ages don't just make things cold, they often make things much drier as well. Much like northern antlions, Nursilla may be better adapted to handle the cold than first thought. The prey skinning behaviour may also help with insulation. And places like the primal forest may once have been flanked by cold desert, or at least arid areas some tens of thousands of years ago. The behaviourally plastic Nursilla adapted to their new environments by using webs over digging pits as extensively. A lot of Nursilla's behavioural traits seem to align with antlions and harsher environments quite well too. As well as the possible insulation point, the prey selection Nursilla seems to exhibit with preference for Kezu and Gypsaros seems to suggest they only really go for profitable species, and that they can also use variable strategies when attacking. The webs may also not be initially made to create the large spider-like webs that we see in the sunken hollow. They may have started as an adaptation to help stabilise sand traps, or to knock down prey escaping from them so they can be grabbed, as antlions do by flicking sand at their prey when it tries to escape. We know Nursilla has favoured prey species, and this may explain some of its more extreme adaptations for predation. Nursilla has a pair of giant mouthparts known as sizhorns, stated to be used in prey capture. But why use these instead of just a more normal spider-like mouth? And the answer may be the anti-predator mechanisms of her preferred prey. Gypsaros has a strong beak that can likely deliver a good amount of force, a bulbed tail that can likely rupture an eye if it got a good shot, and it can spit venom as well as deliver a reasonable kick with its powerful limbs. It's also very enduring and can keep up a fight for a good time. The Sizhorns may be something of a multi-tool here. For one, it may allow them to actually puncture the tough rubbery hide of Gypsaros, which may be too tough for more conventional mouthpieces. But for another, it also means they can keep it at arm's reach while doing so. Spiders will carefully aim their attacks when dealing with dangerous prey, aiming for certain parts of the body whilst avoiding others. Antlions also have giant jaws not so dissimilar from the sizhorns as well, and engage in a behaviour called prey beating, where seized animals are repeatedly thumped against the ground. This is only used against armoured prey like beetles, and it's believed it both helps penetration and disorients tougher prey to prevent its escape. Nursilla may undergo similar actions with her own prey. Prey beating may disorient kezu and prevent them using their electric shocks or biting in retaliation. Similarly, it may prevent Gypsaros from using its flash or fighting back, whilst also helping penetrate its rubbery hide. Gypsaros and Kezu aren't easy prey, and may be hard to find as well as capture. Some of a spider's most important organs are on its legs and feet, and they often detect prey by vibrations they make, as a lot of other predatory invertebrates do as well. Gypsaros's playing dead, 
may well be a method of avoiding detection for individuals that have escaped the initial attack of Nursilla, reducing their vibrations and preventing detection in low-light areas until they can escape. Similarly, Kezu's very sedentary nature may double as a method of protection, giving them very little output into their environment and making them actually very hard to pin down. This may be why Nursilla quite closely inspects the hunter when she injects it with sleep toxin. She's quite cautious of her prey pulling a fast one on her. So despite the seemingly plentiful carcasses Nursilla hang around their web, their successful capture rates may not be exceptionally high. The Sizhorns may also come into play here as a feeding adaptation. Wolf spiders are seen to use their chelicerae to masticate food items into a meatball, which is believed to make up for low prey capture with better prey utilization. Nursilla's bizarre mouth parts may also be essential for the most efficient use of as much of her prey as she can take once it's captured. Rachna Kadaki's mouthpieces are also just as bizarre with her having an unusual head and neck arrangement similar to those of pelican spiders. She has a long, extendable neck and versatile mandibles. So what might this tell us about her predatory habits? Well, pelican spiders are actually dedicated araniophages, which is to say they almost exclusively eat other spiders. Even when offered live prey from other taxa, they will often reject these and only accept spiders. This doesn't seem especially likely for Rachna though. She's massive, and other large spider-like animals aren't exactly common enough to sustain her in relatively sparse environments she inhabits. But maybe the methods of predation can still transfer over. It's suggested that pelican spiders have such jaws and necks to hold spiders at bay due to their potential danger. So it may well be that even without a diet of other spiders, Rachna may still hunt dangerous prey that are best kept at arm's length away from them. There may be some adaptation for hunting hidden or burrowing prey as well. Pelican spiders will often invade the webs of the spiders they hunt, seemingly plucking on it to try and locate the spider within. Indeed, it's suggested that they may well be adapted to enter spider lairs in search of them. It could also be that Rachna really lives up to the pelican spider name, and hunts almost like an aquatic bird. With the ability to detect vibrations in the sand, it could be that Rachna is something of a pissing specialist, waiting along movement routes to launch out her neck and seize them from the sand. It keeps them at a safe distance from its body, due to their bladed venomous fins and snapping jaws. Overall, the bizarre mouthpieces of the Temneserans likely suggest their adaptations for a hunting life in the land of the Wyverns. Taking far riskier prey than many actual spiders, their weaponry and tactics had to change significantly to suit. As well as physical tricks, Rachna may also use various behavioural strategies to help her find food as well. Whilst naturally ranging over wide areas like Rachna herself, one thing cursorial spiders use is restricted area search, which is to say when they find something, they change their movement patterns to comb that area for other food items. Considering Rachna's occupation of harsh environments like deserts and also volcanoes, this is likely a good shout to find food. In such harsh environments, when you find one prey item, you're likely to find other living things congregating there for whatever resource drew the initial one in, be they prey or smaller predators, both of which Rachna can eat. This is also helpful to comb areas like local water sources that will naturally be prey magnets. Rachna's use of fire seems a little out of the blue, but this could be a replacement for Nursilla's poisonous spikes. Without it, Rachna has comparatively little to defend herself with, and a flamethrower could well make all the difference in repelling attackers. Blast is something of a natural progression from this, using a similar flammable fuel, but with greater energetic potential, but also greater energetic cost. So accordingly, Rachna advertises this a lot more with her bright thorns. There's a clear visual difference of her greater threat to try and dissuade other monsters from attacking, so she doesn't actually have to use her blast and thus burn energy making more. As some real spiders do, Rachna also carries her young, the rachnoids, with her in a silken egg sac on her back. Unlike other spiders, the rachnoid actually appear to help their mother, as well as the fight, they serve themselves as bait for prey, an attack opposition to her as well. 
This early life cooperation may be the rachnoid earning their keep, as carrying your young around is expensive. Wolf spiders that do this have decreased foraging success, albeit not too significantly, but they do also have increased predation from carrying the sack. It's possible that these costs increase with size, or even new costs are imposed, and so cooperation between mother and young is an adaptation to reduce the cost of the young being carried. There is also the case that in wolf spiders this prevents their own mother eating them. Wolf spiders are keen cannibals, but the presence of an egg sac inhibits mother spiders from eating smaller individuals of her species, and this behaviour fades after her own young have dispersed. So Rachna may also be protecting the rachnoid from herself as well as other predators. Rachna carrying her young with her may also give them considerably better odds in later life as she appears to share prey with them. Cursorial spiders given dietary supplements in early life had superior growth and survivorship, and being able to eat from their mother's large and profitable kills almost certainly gives the rachnoids an early life boost. It's unknown how long she actually keeps them around for, but even just a period of a few weeks for the first few molts or so could well make all the difference here. Environment may also come into play here too. Rachna live in very harsh, dry environments, typically arid areas, but also volcanic regions on occasion too. There's some evidence that suggests being attached to the mother may create something of a microclimate for the young. This helps prevent desiccation, which would be quite a risk for the rachnoid in such hot, dry environments. Finally, it may be worth asking how close are the Temneserans to actual spiders, and how closely related may Nursilla and Rachnakadaki be? To which the answers are not very and not very. Despite being generally arachnid-like, the Temneserans are pretty far removed from actual spiders in great swaths of their morphology, but I am the Kaiju King has drawn up a possible phylogenetic tree of their relations, as well as body diagrams as how they evolve. Rachna is suggested to be very basal in comparison to the more derived Nursilla, and this is actually supported by pelican spiders themselves being a truly ancient family, one that has been around since the Jurassic. If this is analogous to Rachna, the Temneserans may be very ancient indeed, so why aren't they more diverse and successful? Well, that may be as a result of their size. To a spider, the canopy of a tree is its own habitat. To a monkey, it's the whole forest. As animals grow significantly, microhabitats stop being a cause for divergence, and species diversity generally drops. It's unknown how large the family is, and if there are still spider-sized Temneserans extant but their giant relatives will never enjoy the same incredible diversity as our own invertebrates. For my thoughts on the two spiders, I think they're both fantastic. They're both very Monster Hunter and some of the most original and unique fights and designs in the series. With Rachna, it's also nice to see such a high-tier Temneseran as well. And as I've said in earlier videos, I think she's one of the best of the new Rise Monsters, both overall and for combining animal and yokai traits for a good monster that uses the strengths of both for its design and fight rather than just being forced or muddled. They're both just great additions. For Nursilla, if it wasn't for Seregios, she'd probably be my best newcomer for 4th gen. Lower tier monsters still have so much character and Nursilla is no exception. With her very jerky erratic movements and bizarre screams like a mix of human and elephant, her displayed relationships with other monsters and her environment almost make her feel like a world-style monster before world, and I can't wait to see her in another main series game with more environmental behaviours and turf wars. If Capcom were willing to get really creative, I think ditching Shrouded as an official subspecies and just making Nursilla just have different skin and ailments from whatever low-ranking wyvern is in that biome would be a really great touch, as hinted at by some of her official concept art. There's still a lot that can be done, I think. Also, I do think Shrouded Nursilla should have been wearing Gendrome hide. Kezu may be able to stun the player, but he does it with electricity, not a neurotoxin. So Shrouded Nursilla doesn't make too much sense in this regard. Unless, of course, she is also eating Gendrome and Genprey, and just for some reason has a Kezu skin in the desert. Either way, thanks for watching. 
And for any who are interested in supporting this channel further, I've also set up a Patreon. There are various levels for different memberships with some of the usual bonuses offered, so please do take a look if you're interested, and I'll appreciate whatever you feel like you can give. The diagrams for Temneseran Morphology were created by creature design artist I Am The Kaiju King, who also created the Gosarag skull for that video. He's created a number of excellent other monster skulls as well as various cladograms, some set to appear in future videos. Be sure to check out his Tumblr, where he occasionally offers commissions, as well as his own topics on lore and spec bio in Monster Hunter, and other universes, as well as his own original works. Now to address a few things from the past few videos. One, it was pointed out to me that Hans Zimmer only provided the main theme for Prehistoric Planet. Anze Rosman and Kara Talv did the rest of the music, and it just seems Zimmer's name got slapped on everything. There were also a lot of interesting comments with pros and cons for the various paleo media formats, worth checking out in the comments too. Regarding the pterosaur courtship scene, as a few discussed this, it may be more complex than I initially thought. In some species like ruffs, masculine males tolerate feminine ones at legs, and females may even select them more than masculine ones. But then birds also don't have a specially pronounced size dimorphism as the pterosaurs were depicted, and in species that do, like iguanas and some other lizards, as well as elephant seals and bullfrogs, mating is more in line with my comments in the video. In species with this sort of organisation, lack of male control over females increases female choosiness, and some males also don't monopolise females, but instead the resources females want. So, all in all, this is to say that breeding systems can be complex, and it's not unreasonable pterosaurs may have been very different from today's animals, as you'd really need to look, or rather estimate, at the social and ecological landscape, and the spatial and temporal distribution of resources critical to females, to really get as close to answering the question of how some pterosaurs may have mated. I'm not going to do this myself, but I'm all ears for anyone who wants to give this a shot. A lot pointed out that adult Shagarumagala's dander apparently hormonally suppresses Gormagala in the area, and this is also what causes chaotic Gormagala too. Dellinger also suggested once molted, Shagaru may eat comparatively little compared to Gore, and that, like some invertebrates, its main goal may just be reproduction. And this is an interesting thought, especially as some invertebrates that often have very long juvenile stages often have very short adult stages where it's effectively just mate and then die. The notion of Shagaru having quite a short lifespan is a beguiling one, and sort of fits with the life and death theme these elders have. It may also be why Shagaru selects for relatively barren areas like the Heaven's Mount, to find areas with as few predators as possible to have their young, whatever form they take. At long last, there's also a trailer for Season 2 of Primal, so be sure to check that out. I'll be covering that in future as well. And as for the next monster, 